that Grand Admiral Thrawn is missing from your delegation. Any word on when he will be able to participate in the Shadow Council? You have spoken of his imminent return. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This is The Way. This will be my full Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 7 video. There were so many Easter eggs and references paying off so many long-running plots and setting stuff up for Ahsoka with Grand Admiral Thrawn. So we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes. I just did a trailer video for Ahsoka with Grand Admiral Thrawn in it. We finally saw him on screen, so I'll talk about him during the video when we get to that part of the plot. But careful for spoilers from the episode if you haven't seen it yet. We'll just start at the beginning, work our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs and WTF moments. Starting with the episode title, The Spies, it was a reference to what Elia Kane was doing on Coruscant. She was spying for Moff Gideon, informing him on what was going on with the New Republic so that the Shadow Council could maneuver around them. As part of this grand plan, the plan that Grand Admiral Thrawn is orchestrating his heir to the Empire and retaking the galaxy from the New Republic. The actual opening scene starts on Coruscant in the lower levels with Elia Kane going to a secret meeting to get more orders from Moff Gideon in the Imperial Remnant, the Shadow Council, confirming a lot of our theories about what she's been doing this whole time, how Moff Gideon's been behind her actions. She talks to an Imperial probe droid like the ones they see in all the movies and the series. They use probe droids a lot of the time. She informs Moff Gideon, who's talking to her via Hollow from his base, about the armor's Mandalorians defeating Gorian Shard's pirates on Navarro. Notice how he asks which group of Mandalorians helped them, because he was personally behind the Great Purge and scattering all the remaining Mandalorians, and he controls Mandalore currently, so he wants to know which faction has moved against him. Also, when he says which group of Mandalorians, that's meant to set up the concept of the Mandalorian super commandos that he has in the Praetorian Guard working for the Empire of the Imperial Remnant. Like, there's a faction that is now working for him, the former Maldalorians, the former members of Death Watch that the armor said scattered and broke into different factions themselves. During the episode, they also confirm what happened to Death Watch after the Clone Wars and how they scattered to different factions, basically, and how their group now, the Armors group, formed out of that and they call themselves the Children of the Watch. I think that's meant to set up the idea that some of those former Death Watch that became Maldalorians and then became Mandalorian Super Commandos working for the Empire, and then they started working for Moff Gideon after Return of the Jedi. So the whole idea is that not all Mandalorian factions are meant to be good. It's just foreshadowing for the end of the episode when they reveal that group of super commandos left over from Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels. And Moff Gideon basically answers all of our theories about his grand plan and his specific plans and how they're different from Grand Admiral Thrawn's grand plan. Lots of grand planning, grand people in the Star Wars universe right now. But the whole idea is that Moff Gideon has had her running interference against the New Republic inside that requisition office, doing everything she could to keep them from getting involved in the Outer Rim, allowing his faction, the Empire, or at least in different parts of the galaxy, to rise without having to worry about the New Republic finding out what they're doing. It sounds like she's been very successful in that, like we saw when Carson Teba was denied help from Colonel Tuttle. It sounds like she's been doing that for a long time now. Moff Gideon has also been counting on the Mandalorian factions to continue being at odds with each other to prevent exactly from what happened during this episode, Bo-Katan beginning to regain her former military strength by uniting them together. Which is why initially he doesn't believe Elliot Kane, like, no way, there's no way they would all come together, they all hate each other. Then they jumped to Moff Gideon's side of the transmission, and if it wasn't clear, the whole idea during the episode is they wanted to reveal that Moff Gideon had been on the Mandalore planet near the Great Forge with this base this whole time. So it's like the call is coming from inside the room kind of thing. Like he'd been transmitting in this base here, talking to the other Shadow Council, orchestrating his whole operation from the planet Mandalore. He walks past the Imperial Super Commandos, which he controls, past more tanks of failed clone experiments. They also clarify some of our theories about what's going on with all the Grogu cloning plot. And it turns out there are a couple different plans at play here as the Shadow Council starts arguing with each other, each one having a different idea about what they should be doing with their resources. I'll explain that in a second, but his cloning tanks, like his specific cloning experiments, are a callback to the Mandalorian Season 2 and all of Dr. Pershing's Grogu cloning experiments. He walks into a meeting with almost the entire Imperial Remnant forces, with all the admirals, generals, captains, like all the leaders who are acting as warlords, controlling different sectors of the galaxy. Like the Imperial Remnant has basically divided the galaxy up into different sectors, so that's why we haven't seen every single one of them up to this point. 
These past couple seasons, the show has mostly been localized to very specific parts of the galaxy. Really good example of them exploring different parts of the galaxy is the Star Wars Skeleton Crew series. That's going to visit a completely different part, and they'll probably run into one of the other factions of this Imperial Remnant. Here's the thing, though. They actually didn't explain who every single one of these Imperial Warlords is. Only a couple of them, but the ones that they do reveal are huge, deep-cut Easter eggs for big storylines, particularly for the Grand Admiral Thrawn original trilogy, the Heir to the Empire movie that they're setting up the big crossover. The person who's speaking when he walks in is Xander Berkeley, who's playing Gilead Plan. You might recognize him from other series, but Plan is from the original Thrawn trilogy. He's meant to be his right-hand man, which is why during his speech when he's talking, he keeps referencing Grand Admiral Thrawn's return. We have to wait for his return. Grand Admiral Thrawn's return will herald in the re-emergence of our military. Like they're planning on a giant strike, like actually launching an all-out war against the New Republic once Grand Admiral Thrawn arrives who we just saw in the Ahsoka trailer, played by Lars Mikkelsen, who also voiced the character on Star Wars Rebels. I cannot wait to see him on Ahsoka. Because next week is the Mandalorian Season 3 finale, Episode 8, we might get a teaser for him at the end of that episode. Most of you probably remember him from the Sherlock series with Benedict Cumberbatch. Everything's available for a price. You're making me an offer? A Christmas present. And what are you giving me for Christmas, Mr. Holmes? I will start my operations here and pull the rebels apart piece by piece. They'll be the architects of their own destruction. But Pelayan is cautioning hiding their true strength until Thrawn returns so the New Republic will just leave them alone. They won't find out what they're doing until it's too late. But he does note how the New Republic is weak right now and they're gaining more and more assets. That's a callback to this entire New Republic storyline this season. They've tried to drag the New Republic under the bus for so many episodes. They seem kind of ineffectual, they're spinning their wheels, they're not really doing that much. They're also destroying all their military assets, like they have all these Star Destroyers, all these former Imperial capital ships that they're scrapping, and they're scrapping their former capital ships from the Rebellion. So they're trying to establish why Grand Admiral Thrawn's forces the Imperial Remnant would be able to challenge them. The next Imperial Warlord says his faction of the Imperial Remnant has been busy plundering hyperspace lanes in a different sector of the galaxy, just stealing from trade ships that pass through. One of the other female admirals says that there are people on all the planets in the galaxy who are still loyal to the Empire. People kind of like Cyril Karn on the Andor series. People who love the order that the Empire brings, even if it's at the cost of personal freedoms. Another one of the leaders advocates for a show of strength, so it's just meant to show how they all have different ideas about what they should be doing, and who's the actual captain of this ship, so to speak. Moff Gideon arguing about how a new person should lead them, when really it's actually Grand Admiral Thrawn that they've been waiting for, implying that the Imperial Remnant, just in general, all these different factions all over the galaxy, have been looking to Grand Admiral Thrawn as their de facto leader after the fall of the Empire in Return of the Jedi. But when Pelayan keeps talking about the re-emergence of Grand Admiral Thrawn, his return, when is he going to show up? Because Moff Gideon gets kind of impatient. Like, when will Thrawn finally show up? We've been waiting for him this whole time, all these years. We might get a teaser for that during the finale, but mostly we'll see that start to happen during the Ahsoka series, because Ahsoka's big thing is trying to find Grand Admiral Thrawn. Also looking for Ezra Bridger, because he was lost with Thrawn at the same time. I started hearing whispers about Thrawn's return as heir to the Empire. But that storyline will culminate with a giant war with the Imperial Remnant and Thrawn. That'll be their big Heir to the Empire movie. My early theory right now is that they'll call that movie Heir to the Empire and just based on the original Thrawn trilogy. But then they reveal Commandant Hux, who's actually working on Project Necromancer. He's meant to be the father of General Hux during the sequel trilogy, who'd be a young kid at this point in the timeline. He's also played by Dodal Gleason's real-life brother, Brian Gleason. So a little Easter egg there, keeping it in the family metaphorically and literally. But he represents the faction that's part of the First Order, implying that the First Order was in league with the main Imperial Remnant forces the entire time, like they weren't always doing their own thing. And Project Necromancer is their project, his goal to bring back the Emperor using the cloning technology, which they actually started during the Bad Batch episodes. The whole Mount Tannis plot on Bad Batch is about them trying to perfect cloning technology to resurrect the Emperor, being able to clone a Force-sensitive person, which they haven't been able to do up to this point. And provide Commandant Hux enough time to deliver on Project Necromancer. But here's where we get back to the idea that none of these Shadow Council members agree with each other about what they should be doing. 
Moff Gideon seems like he, one, does not care about Grand Admiral Thrawn or bringing the Emperor back. He complains that he's grown tired of waiting for Thrawn. They need to elect a new leader for the Shadow Council, like a de facto leader of this new empire. And obviously he thinks it should be him, even though in a funny way, Commandant Hunk speaks up and says, don't worry, that's what Project Necromancer is for. We're going to bring back somebody else who's even better than Grand Admiral Thrawn. Obviously he's talking about Emperor Palpatine, but the funny way that Moff Gideon reacts to this, he's like, you know, that's nice, but how about we do something else? How about we not bring back the Emperor? That's actually a pretty big thing with Grand Admiral Thrawn's character too. Grand Admiral Thrawn never liked the Emperor. He actually only pretended to submit to him and join the Empire as a way to protect his people, the Chiss. That's one of the reasons why Grand Admiral Thrawn is a much more complex type of antagonist in the Star Wars universe, because he's not a villain the same way that the Emperor was a villain. His ultimate goal in creating order in the galaxy was to protect his people, like his first loyalty was to the Chiss race, and everything he did was in service of the Chiss race. Even though in pursuit of that, he's doing a lot of terrible things, like obviously he's going to be one of the big antagonists of this Heir to the Empire movie that they do. So he does not want the Emperor to come back because the Emperor basically would have used up the resources of his people. The same with Moff Gideon is using up the resources of the Mandalorians and all these other cultures to his own ends. Somehow Palpatine returned. So neither Moff Gideon or Grand Admiral Thrawn want the Emperor to come back. But obviously nobody told Commandant Hux about this. Like they have this whole faction of the First Order off in the unknown regions that are like, no, 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 we have to bring the Emperor back. Which is why he's complained to Moff Gideon about not giving him Dr. Pershing's cloning technology and research that he found using Grogu. Implying that Moff Gideon has just been stringing him along like, uh, you know, we lost all that. He got captured by the New Republic. Maybe you'll get that research someday. This confirms a big theory that I've had since season one when they teased that whole Grogu cloning plot. The whole idea is that Moff Gideon wants to take the Beskar weapons, technology, Beskar steel, armor, and the Grogu cloning technology to create Force-sensitive clones in Beskar armor, basically make an invincible force of troopers. But they also want to tease this idea that the Imperial Remnant is kind of fighting with itself over what it should be doing next. So he's hiding a lot of those plans from the rest of the Shadow Council. Remember, one of the big concepts inside Star Wars is that evil often defeats itself, like Darth Vader is the person who ultimately defeated the Emperor, threw him down that elevator shaft. So don't be surprised if something similar happens during this big Heir to the Empire Thrawn movie that they eventually do, culminating all these events. When Palayan references the Grand Plan, that's Thrawn's Grand Plan, also another eye wink at Thrawn being a Grand Admiral. When Moff Gideon complains about Palayan and Commandant Hux of the First Order amassing resources to their own end and not sharing them, that's more of a reference to what's going on with the First Order during this part of the timeline. They're located in the Unknown Regions up here. They're currently building the Starkiller base, which obviously they won't finish until the sequel trilogy much later in the timeline. That's where all the extra resources are going. But when Moff Gideon requests three extra Praetorian Guards, those are the same types of Praetorian Guards you saw in Last Jedi. Also setting up the end of the episode when they arrived to kill Paz Vizsla. So RIP to him. Don't worry, I'll talk about that when we get to that part of the episode. The whole idea with the Praetorian Guard is that they're not meant to be force sensitive. They're not Sith, but they were Emperor Palpatine's personal royal guard, like his handpicked guard of the fiercest stormtroopers and people that he would train in all the different martial arts of the galaxy, like Terakasi. They were trained in Jedi martial arts. They wear Beskar armor, they wield the most dangerous weapons, like those stun batons are meant to be the same kinds of stun batons that are used by General Grievous' guards. You also see those during The Last Jedi too, so it's a good example of how good they do against regular Jedi. They're not meant to be former Inquisitorious or anything like that, like they weren't Inquisitors, they weren't Force sensitive, but they're meant to be the most hardcore fighting group in the galaxy next to regular Mandalorians. Also their weapons are Beskar too, which is why they're able to pierce Paz Vizsla's Beskar armor. They also reveal here that the TIE Interceptors that we saw in Episode 3 belong to Moff Gideon. He's also requested more of them. We find out what was going on with them too being stationed at Mandalore, the planet near the Great Forge. But he explains why it's so important for them to stop Bo-Katan and the Mandalorians from fully coming together because he needs all those Beskar resources. Obviously it'd be good for the Shadow Council, the Imperial Remnant, but Moff Gideon really wants this all for his own personal gain. The rest of the Shadow Council agrees to give him what he asked for setting up the end of the episode and they go out on their own for the Empire which is meant to be sort of a darker parallel for This Is The Way where Paz Vizsla goes out at the end of the episode. Long live the Empire! Long live the Empire! No! This is the way. Then they jump back to Navarro where the townspeople are still cleaning up the wreckage of Gorian Shard's pirate battle. Not a lot of time has passed since that episode. 
Bo-Katan returns with Mando, the Night Owls, all their ships, including Moff Gideon's old light cruiser, which now has the skull of the Mythosaur painted on the bottom. Also, the Mythosaur is the symbol of all Mandalorians in all different factions, regardless of their different beliefs. They reveal the armor's group have created an encampment in the lava flats that Grief Karka gifted to them earlier. I'm sure given enough time, they create more permanent homes. The armor sees them, knowing instantly that it means Bo-Katan was successful in gaining the support of the Night Owls. Remember, there are only one other group of Mandalorians, even though we meet a second group when they're on the Mandalore planet, a smaller group. It just meant to show you that there are many other factions of Mandalorians out there. You notice on Bo-Katan's ship too, Grogu is now riding in her lap, not in his little pod. More Space Mom vibes here. It's just another sign of how close Grogu feels to her. He thinks about her the same way that he thinks of Mando as the surrogate father. They give you a wide shot of their fleet now. They've got a bunch of Mandalorian fighters like Bo-Katan's, Moff Gideon's old light cruiser, at least two Imperial transport ships like they stole during season two. It's a pretty decent fighting force. When they disembark and roll up on each other, it's meant to be kind of like the vibes that you got during episode three when Bo-Katan met the armors group for the first time and they were mistrustful initially. Also denoted here what all the Night Owls take their helmets off because that's a big no-no for the armors group. Just showing you how different they are. With the armor chilling things out by banging her Beskar Forge Hammer together, another symbol of Mandalore itself, the Forge Hammer, foreshadowing them traveling to the Great Forge, like the symbol of their people, the heart of their culture, as Axe Woves calls it. When she says they'll have a banquet to celebrate them coming, the funny thing here you remember is that the armor's group can't eat without going to some different place where they can actually take their helmets off. So the joke during the banquet is that the only group that is eating are the night owls themselves. The rest of the armor's Mandalorians are just kind of standing there watching them eat. When Grief Karga gives Mando the booze from Coruscant, I think that's meant to be a callback to Elia Kane and Dr. Pershing and what's currently happening on Coruscant. They'll probably address that during episode eight. He also reveals what's happened to IG-11 and how they've turned it into IG-12 in basically like a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Krang body for Grogu. Like they go full Krang with Grogu. Why haven't you completed my new body? You may feel some disorientation when you revive in your new body. With him just riding around using IG-11 like a mech. They mostly use the early part of this episode with his body for comedy, with Grogu being able to communicate by pressing buttons for simple words like yes and no with Taika Waititi's voice as IG-11, even though they're calling the droid IG-12. Mostly it's meant to give Grogu huge weapons and defensive upgrade. They don't really wind up using it that much during the episode other than him breaking up the fight. I think the idea is that in episode 8 in future seasons, he'll use it in actual battle, like Grogu will actually wind up saving people. But the main idea now is that he's actually much more useful in battle. Even though he is crazy powerful in the force, he's still kind of like a glass cannon, like he is incredibly vulnerable. As they run out, he just keeps pressing the button, yes, 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 stealing a bunch of food that he can get his hands on. The shop owner that he keeps stealing from is a Tar Sun. We actually just saw a Tar Sun Jedi during the Star Wars Acolyte trailer. I just did a video for it, so I'll add a link in the description below. That's one of the few new Star Wars series coming next year that isn't connected to what's happening in The Mandalorian with all the Thrawn plot right now. That's set during the High Republic, so it's like a much earlier part, about 100 years before Phantom Menace. During the feast, Bo-Katan gives them another call to action speech, reiterating why they need to retake the Mandalore planet and drop some big teasers when she says the bombings from the Great Purge, the TIE bombers, reawaken dormant species. The radiation problems prevent them from communicating to or from the planet's surface. That's why they can't radio their fleet when they're attacked by the Mandalorian super commandos. She wants to move the fleet to Mandalore to retake the planet or begin to retake the planet, revive the Great Forge using a small force so they can start making new weapons, Beskar armor again, Mandalorian weapons and armor. Beskar armor and weapons are so much better than all the other armor in the galaxy. That's exactly why Moff Gideon wants to prevent them from retaking Mandalore. Everyone agrees to go, including the armor who was just talking to Bo-Katan about her memories of the Great Forge when she was much younger. They don't reveal much about the armor's backstory. Hopefully we'll get some teasers for that in episode eight. Bo-Katan reveals how she originally lost the Darksaber to Moff Gideon. She surrendered it to him, believing that the Empire would allow the other Mandalorians to live after they bombed the planet, after the Night of a Thousand Tears. She reveals that after she surrendered the Darksaber to him, they either scattered them all or killed any that tried to remain, with a few exceptions, like there are still a few Mandalorians, obviously, that were living on the planet that we find. When she starts talking about the ISB, Moff Gideon rose through the ISB. He was a member of that group. That's the same group we see on Andor with the white uniforms, meaning that Moff Gideon used to be running around in a white uniform before he became a Moff. And this is happening right before the events of A New Hope, before the events of the original trilogy. 
The armor explains that her group survived the Children of the Watch because they were exiled to Concordia because they were part of Death Watch or they rose through Death Watch before Death Watch basically scattered to the four winds. And her group was the group that sort of rose out of that. But because they were on Concordia, they were able to escape the Empire before they were able to arrive after bombing the main Mandalore planet. This gets back to the whole idea with the Mandalorian Super Commandos and the Maul DeLoreans that I was talking about. This original Death Watch, like what happened to them? After the events of the Clone Wars, they basically broke apart, but you have to imagine that when Darth Maul won the Darksaber and took over Mandalore, a couple of the Mandalorians that were part of Death Watch swore allegiance to him, becoming the Maul DeLoreans, then eventually those evolved into the Imperial Super Commandos that are now working for Moff Gideon. So all the talk of Death Watch is just meant to set up all the Mandalorian Super Commando stuff that you see with Moff Gideon at the end of the episode. Mando then apologizes to Bo-Katan for believing all these lies about her. He'd been taught all these wrong things about what she did. Oh, look, we thought you actually surrendered. You were this weak person and selfish. When she responds by saying the Darksaber is all she has to unify her people, that's a foreshadow for the Mythosaur reveal, the sign that all Mandalorian factions take as a rally cry to come together and set aside their differences. I think we'll see more of that in Episode 8. I still think that Grogu will help them in trying to calm it down, speaking to it through the Force or communicating to it through the Force, the way that he did with the Rancor at the end of the Book of Boba Fett. And when Mando tells her that he'll serve her until her song is written, is basically saying until he either dies or they're successfully retaking Mandalore and defeat the Imperial Remnant, it's as close as you can get in their culture to a marriage proposal, basically. The way she reacts to it, too, it kind of seems like they're trying to develop this closer bond between the two of them. There isn't much that they've done with their relationship. I don't think they're actually going to get together or anything like that anytime soon. But the three of them with Grogu are as close as you can get to a family subunit within all the Mandalorians. Space Mom with Space Dad and the Child. Mando basically telling her, I would die to protect your smile. During the episode, you also probably notice a bunch of new theme music for a bunch of the different groups. So when all the Mandalorians arrive at the planet Mandalore, they play some special Mandalorian theme music they'll probably use in big battle scenes that they have in the future. Moff Gideon also gets a version of that too, with some special Moff Gideon theme music. When they're disembarking on the Mandalorian planet too, it's meant to be a callback to the previous episode when they were fighting the pirates dropping out of their ship. Like their ships are designed to be used by Mandalorians with jetpacks where they drop them out like that all the time. Even Paz Vizsla, the others start having their own versions of PTSD flashbacks, remembering the trauma of the Great Purge. This scene of them all working in formation, dropping to the planet is also meant to be a callback to previously this season, during season one, when they're all fighting together as Mandalorians. We'll probably see a bunch more scenes like this in future seasons in obviously that Thrawn movie where they're all fighting together on screen. When Bo-Katan says they're standing above where their ancient capital used to be, that's the city Sundari that we saw during the Clone Wars, the giant dome city. It's the same ruins where she, Mando, and Grogu were visiting in the first few episodes. They run into another faction of Mandalorians that have been living on the planet since the Great Purge on a sail barge just traveling around like scavengers the whole time. It's meant to look kind of like a classic sailing ship mixed with Jabba's sail barge. You might recognize this new Mandalorian. He's Charles Parnell. He was just in Top Gun Maverick. He's also done a bunch of other TV series and movies. The new faction takes them the rest of the way to the Great Forge. Paz Vizsla and Axe Woves have that funny moment where they're playing the Mandalorian version of chess or like their version of Dejarik, if we're talking about the Star Wars universe. They argue over the rules. Paz Vizsla pulls his vibroblade and they throw down until Grogu stops them from fighting. This is actually meant to be a big metaphor too. The whole idea that Grogu is meant to be the nexus of all these ideals that they believe in, like Mandalorian Jedi. He's meant to be kind of like the second coming of the Tar Vizsla, the original Mandalorian Jedi. So he's going to be a big part of unifying all their different people. Eventually, probably including talking to the Mythosaur through the Force, getting it to chill out. Also, when we talk about Grogu winning over the Mythosaur, which they just tease, wouldn't it be awesome, early theory here, if Grogu winds up using the Mythosaur to destroy Moff Gideon's base on Mandalore? Like, the Mythosaur itself is so huge and powerful, it winds up helping the Mandalorians by crushing a lot of Moff Gideon's resources and ships. Very Thor Ragnarok, like, we might not be enough to defeat you, but he is, and they pull the Thor Ragnarok with Surtur, only it's the Mythosaur this time. And because they want to push to the Mandalorian Super Commandos, Moff Gideon, the Praetorian Guard, they see this giant creature, it's not the Mythosaur, if you can believe that, even though it seems huge, it's not the actual Mythosaur, because it doesn't have those giant tusks of the Mythosaur on it. It's just another major species that was dormant. They're driven into the caves, not too far from the same place Mando, Grogu, and Bo-Katan went in the first few episodes. It's not the exact same place, but it's close. And once they pass by the Great Forge, the former heart of the Mandalorian culture, they're attacked by the Mandalorian Super Commandos, the former Maul DeLoreans now serving Moff Gideon, and the former members of Death Watch that the armor was talking about that broke off. 
But this is why their helmets are Beskar versions of traditional Stormtrooper helmets, because Moff Gideon is basically taking all the most powerful aspects of the Mandalorians, like their Beskar armor, their technology, and using it to beef up his Imperial forces. Really great battle scene, you see the regular Mandalorians are better fighters overall, but the Super Commandos have Beskar armor making them way harder to kill. But this is the whole reason why Moff Gideon wanted Mandalore so bad, he wanted their Beskar to use it for his army of Super Commandos, and he's also trying to create force sensitive clone troopers now with Beskar armor and weapons, using the best of all these different cultures as he says later. Every culture has something to offer, but it would make his army nearly invincible. They chase them deeper past the Great Forge, they find Moff Gideon's Imperial base is constructed there, that's because he set up shop there the minute after they pulled off the Great Purge, so like it's been there for years. That's why they have so many Imperial ships there, it's also where the TIE Interceptors, the TIE Bombers were, that we saw destroy Bo-Katan's ancestral home on Kalevala. They were able to surprise Mando and Bo-Katan so easily because they had been stationed so closely on Mandalore the planet. They trap Mando, he finally whips out his flamethrower. We haven't seen him use his flamethrower that much this season, and during season one it was like a whole big thing, like he almost used his flamethrower in every single episode. And Moff Gideon enters using his own Mandalorian Beskar armor jetpack wearing a Maul DeLorean helmet with the Darth Maul horns on it. Now here's the thing, a lot of big questions about Moff Gideon's past. He didn't used to be a Mandalorian or even a Maul DeLorean. He's more like a Mandalorian fanboy. Remember, he was always part of the ISB. He just wanted their Beskar weapons and technology. Thanks to your planet's rich resources, I have created the next generation Dark Trooper suit. And when he says he's created the next generation of Dark Trooper, that's like the next step up from what we saw during season two, like another upgrade after that. Confirming all our theories about how he escaped after episode five, the Beskar alloy left behind was from his Dark Troopers. He confirms what was going on with the Grogu cloning plot, like they're trying to clone Force-sensitive Dark Troopers now. Every society has something to offer. The cloners, the Jedi, and even the Mandalorians. Putting them in the Beskar armor would basically make them invincible. But his whole conversation about combining the best attributes of different cultures to make something stronger is a callback to Dr. Pershing's speech previously this season where he was talking about his cloning technology, combining all the best aspects of different types of people to create something even better. When he tells them to take Mando to their debriefing room, he probably intends on torturing him for more information about the Mandalorian's forces, the New Republic, just to get more information about what's going on. Probably the same type of torture that was used on Dr. Purging as well, sort of a dark mirror for that, like, ah, we're bad, but the New Republic also doing things that are just as bad. Bo-Katan has another standoff with Moff Gideon, referencing their previous history before A New Hope, during the Great Purge, with a dark saber, which she uses to cut a hole through the blast door for them to escape, which Moff Gideon then opens the other door to try and kill them, allowing Paz Vizsla to sacrifice himself so the others can get away. He goes out like a boss, like he managed to take out most of those regular Imperial Super Commandos even though they were in Beskar armor using his heavy blaster until you see that it overheats because he uses it so much. After which he just starts bum rushing them, pushing them off of the cliff. Then the three Praetorian Guard that Moff Gideon requisitioned enter to kill him. Like I said, they're wearing Beskar armor, they're the best trained fighters in the galaxy using the best weapons, like the most hardcore possible fighters you could possibly get next to the best Mandalorian fighters. You have to assume while Project Necromancer was going on, they were trying to clone the Emperor, even though they were formally his royal guard, his own personal guard, the Imperial Remnant kept them active, kept them training. And after Paz Vizsla dies, RIP, everyone pour one out for him. They slammed to black, and obviously now, pushing into the finale, the Mandalorians have to figure out what to do next now that they know what's really going on. I think the idea is they're going to try and continue convincing the New Republic to help, like, no, no, you don't realize Moff Gideon is trying to use our planet to create this giant fighting force as this Imperial Remnant, even though they don't totally know everything about what's going on with Grand Admiral Thrawn yet. The way that Rosario Dawson talked about that when Ahsoka was yelling about Grand Admiral Thrawn during Mandalorian Season 2, heading into the Ahsoka series, she's one of the few people in the galaxy that recognizes the threat of Grand Admiral Thrawn that he is coming to retake the galaxy from the New Republic. So I don't think that all the Mandalorians are going to figure out everything that's going on with Thrawn by the end of the season. We might get a teaser for that, but it might not be the Mandalorians witnessing Thrawn or learning anything about him specifically. It might just be on the Imperial Remnant's Shadow Council side of things. Like, ah, oh, Grand Admiral Thrawn, you finally arrived. We've been talking about you this whole time. There'll probably be another big space battle in Episode 8 too with Moff Gideon's Imperial Remnant or his forces on Mandalore. If you spotted any other big Easter eggs or references during the episode that I didn't talk about in the video, there was so much stuff that happened, just write it below in the comments. 
My episode 8 finale trailer video will post in the next day. There's also an extended Ahsoka trailer with a whole bunch of extra footage like Sabine using Ezra's lightsaber, more Grand Admiral Thrawn footage. I'll do a video for that next. In my full Mandalorian Season 3 Episode 8 video will post next Wednesday after they release it. Be sure to enable alerts for my channel so you don't miss any of that stuff in trailers for all the new Star Wars series that they announced down in the description below. Everyone click here for that Mandalorian Season 3 Episode 8 video. I'll update the link as soon as I post that and click here for my Ahsoka trailer video. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe. This is the way.